yeah, so thanks for inviting me and for being here. And before I start, I should start with an apology because I think some of you will have seen certain parts of this talk before. Um, it's a kind of mis mishmash of some of the research that I've been doing over the last few years. And given the fit with the workshop theme, um, I hope that you'll still find it useful. Um, okay, so plan for today. Um, I'm gonna start by outlining um, a way of thinking about the structure of model-based science. Um, and in particular, I'm gonna emphasize the idea that modeling um, is a sort of indirect enterprise. So by this, I mean that when we read descriptions of models um, in journal articles and scientific textbooks and classrooms and so on, we shouldn't take them to be um, direct descriptions of target systems, actual systems in the world, but rather we should think about them as describing model systems, which in turn um, have some sort of existence and in turn represent the actual systems in the world that we're ultimately interested in. Um, I'm then gonna talk about how we should think about that representation relation between models and the targets that we're interested in. Um, and I'm gonna talk about two different ways uh, that, that philosophers usually, or two different ways that philosophers either implicitly or explicitly um, assume uh, is at work in understanding that representation relation. So one very popular view is the idea that models are supposed to be similar um, to their targets in some sense to be specified. Um, and another less popular, um, um, but I hope to be useful view um, is to allow for a much more liberal way of thinking about the relationship between models and their targets. Uh, with that in mind, I'm then gonna talk about these, how these two different ways of thinking about um, how models represent um, have implications on how we should understand how idealization works. So I'm gonna characterize idealization um, as instances where models have uh, features which are explicitly distorted versions um, of the features of the target that we're interested in. And then the question is, is how should we think about the way that those distortions play a representational role? Um, I'm gonna argue that on the similarity view of thinking about um, how models represent, by definition, distortions become misrepresentations. Um, and this is what uh, uh, leads a lot of people to assume that idealizations should be understood in terms of misrepresentations. I'm gonna argue that other ways of thinking about how representation works allow for us to uh, 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 accommodate the distortions um, that are present in idealized models as still remaining accurate representations. And then finally, I'm gonna try and do the premise that I had in parentheses about why this matters. Um, I'm going to talk about the upshots that this has in thinking about the notions of factivity um, in understanding and explanation. Okay, so what do I mean by models? Um, well, we can start just with some simple versions. Um, suppose you have tabletop model of the solar system. Um, you've got a concrete object which exists on the tabletop in a school, for example. Uh, you perform some investigations on that concrete object. And as a result, you draw some inferences about another concrete object, um, namely the solar system itself. Uh, similarly, you could think about um, wind tunnels. So you have a scale model in a wind tunnel in a certain model environment. Um, you perform some investigations on it, run some tests, some experiments. Um, and from your investigation of that concrete object, you draw some hypotheses about another concrete object. So in this case, the actual plane um, flying through the Earth's atmosphere. And maybe a more homely example, you could think about um, examples of maps. So suppose that you just had a map on the desk in front of you. You could do some investigations on that map. You could measure some distances. You could uh, 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 plot some bearings. And from your investigation that you're doing on that map, that physical object on the desk in front of you, you can draw some hypotheses about the system um, uh, that it represents, the, the actual uh, Earth. Earth's surface itself. So in all of these cases, the way that I'm thinking about these is you have one physical system, the concrete model system, you can do some investigations on it, investigate its properties, and as a result you can draw some conclusions about another physical system, so the target system that you're ultimately interested in. For our current purposes, I'm going to take that to be relatively straightforward, um, although as Elkitsis already highlighted in her talk, and I'm sad that she didn't talk about it, um, I am brushing a lot of stuff under the carpet here. So what I mean by a target system might itself be something that's philosophically contentious. 
Um, and if you're interested in that, then you should go and read Alcetis's paper. Um, but the general idea is, is that we can just talk about things like um, the solar system, things like the plane as it travels through the Earth's atmosphere. And that's, that's what I'm ultimately interested in. Now, the problem with these sorts of examples is um, they don't obviously fit the mold of many other things that we might call models. Um, so in Ian Hacking's words, many models are things that we don't hold in our hands, they're things that we hold in our heads instead. So rather than investigating one physical object to learn about another, we investigate in some sense um, a, a model object, either an imaginary object or a mathematical object or something like that. So as an example, and I'm going to talk about this later on, um, suppose you're interested in uh, the tidal behavior um, on the Earth, and I say to you, well, you know, we can construct a model with three bodies, um, Newtonian gravity acting between the bodies and having such and such positions and orbits. Um, what, am I, what is it that I'm describing when I describe uh, such an object? And it's relatively um, uh, uh, well accepted, although there are uh, people who dispute this, that we can frame that way of thinking about model-based science in this sort of threefold way. So we take the model description to be specifying a model object, and then the model object is the thing that represents the target system. So just to put a little bit more meat on the bones, you take the, the, the linguistic items, suppose there are three bodies, classical gravity, etc. This specifies a Newtonian system, and then we talk about the relationship between that Newtonian system and the Earth's tides, the actual, the actual solar system um, that, 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 that in which we live. And I said relatively uh, accepted, but not without um, its detractors. So I take on to actually be one of the leaders of the opposition there. He, 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 he doesn't like the idea um, that we should think about uh, uh, model-based science in this indirect way. So for this reason, you could just take the rest of this talk as a kind of um, conditional. If we should think about model-based science as indirect representation, then how should we think about the role of idealization? Okay, so that's the structure that I want you to be thinking in. Um, don't read the descriptions as applying to the target system directly. Read them as specifying a model. The model then represents the target. What I'm interested in is this red arrow, this representation relation between the model and the target. Um, okay, so you could ask in virtue of what um, uh, a model represents the target or is an accurate representation of the target. And one, I think, relatively reasonable suggestion would be along the following lines. Um, you could say that the model represents the target only if it has some certain relevant features, I'm calling this F1 through Fn, um, and the model user exports those features to the target. And then the idea is, is that if the target actually has those features, then the model is an accurate representation of them. Um, I've called out some of the words here just to try and make it so that this is as non-straw man a position as possible. So it's uh, allowing there to be a role for model users. It's not saying that similarity um, is a sufficient condition and so on and so forth. It's, it's trying to be a relatively weak claim um, about thinking about model target representation as proposed similarities um, with accurate representation coming out as those similarities uh, actually holding. So that's all quite abstract. Just to go back to the examples that we had before, you could ask whether or not the scale model in the wind tunnel um, is an accurate or inaccurate representation of, for example, certain dimensionless uh, parameters. So scale modelers try very hard, uh, accommodating all the um, uh, effects that scaling has to ensure that their model matches their target with respect to some parameters. And then if they're successful, then you could say that the model is an accurate representation with respect to those parameters. Um, the Reynolds number being one of the examples. Um, or you could think about the Newtonian model of the tides, and you could say, uh, in this case, um, it's being used I'll talk about this later on, but it's being used to try and explain tidal variance across the course of a, a lunar month. But what's important is, is that in the model, it is the case that the tides go from high tide to low tide once a day, but also that high tide changes depending on um, <coughs> where in the month you are. So in that sense, the model um, is uh, similar to the target with respect to the fact that you have 
tidal variance across the lunar month. And so you could say, according to the reasonable suggestion, that the model is an accurate representation of the target in those respects. Um, anyone who knows about map projections, um, if you think about the Mercator projection, um, where uh, it, it's, a, it's a projection which preserves bearings, it was originally used for navigational purposes. Um, because of the fact that the bearings on the Mercator projection um, match the bearings that you would take on the surface of the Earth, according to reasonable suggestion, we could say that the Mercator projection accurately represents bearings. Um, but if you know about map projections, uh, the problem with the Mercator projection is that it distorts relative size of landmass, especially as you go to the pole. Um, and for that reason, sometimes people say we should use other map projections like the Gals Peters projection, where in this case, that projection is similar to the uh, Earth's surface in the sense that um, same size landmass areas on the map correspond to same size landmass areas on the Earth's surface. So the two are similar with respect to relative area. And so you could say that the projection accurately represents relative area. Okay, so if you thought that that was how models represented, then how should you think about idealization? Um, well, the way that I'm characterizing it from the perspective of someone who thinks about representation in terms of similarity is that you should think about idealized, idealized aspects of models um, as being the representationally relevant model features which are explicitly, and you might want to also include, known not to be shared with the target systems. Um, so these are features where the model has a certain feature, it's supposed to correspond to a certain feature in the target system, and the model user knows that the model feature is a distortion of the feature that it corresponds to in the target system. And if you thought about representation in terms of similarity, then in virtue of the fact that the idealized feature was a distortion, it would follow that the idealized feature was a misrepresentation too. Um, so just to go over the examples, if the wind tunnel um, accurately captures or, or is similar to the target with respect to some dimensionless parameter, uh, like the Reynolds number, then usually it will be dissimilar to the target with respect to some other parameter, like, for example, the Freud number. And because of this distortion, this dissimilarity between the model and the target, you can say that the wind tunnel misrepresents that aspect of the feature <coughs> of the plane. Sorry. Um, with the Newtonian model, um, in the model, the tidal behavior is induced by uh, a, a classical Newtonian force. Um, we know, presumably, that we don't live in a Newtonian world. Um, so in this respect, the model and the target are different because what induces tidal forces in the actual world is space-time curvature. Um, so in that sense, according to the similarity account of representation, you would think about the Newtonian model as misrepresenting what induces the tidal forces in the actual world. And then for the two projections, I said that the Mercator projection captures relative bearing, but it distorts relative landmass. And so according to the um, similarity view of thinking about representation, that distortion ends up being a misrepresentation. And then vice versa for the gals peters projection too. So the crucial idea basically is that if you think about the model having a certain idealized feature, that idealized feature is a distortion of the feature of the target to which it represents. And because of it, the fact that it's a distortion, um, similarity uh, ways of thinking about representation would understand the idealization as a misrepresentation. <coughs> now, the thing that I want to point out here um, is that that's not obviously, or similarity-based accounts of representation um, are not obviously the right way of thinking um, about the relationship between things like models and the targets that they represent. So if I draw a caricature of someone that I don't really like, and I draw in the caricature, I draw them with a big massive nose, um, you could ask, well, how am I representing that person with that caricature? And I take it that people who know how the norms of caricature work wouldn't necessarily say, ah, oh, you're representing him as having a big nose, but rather you would know that there's a connection in the norms of caricature between certain physical features, like having a large nose, and other features, like character, character features, like having, being, having a nosy character. Or more scientifically, if I was to 
dip some litmus paper in uh, a, a lemon juice solution and the litmus paper turned red. I wouldn't say that I'm representing the lemon juice as red, but rather anyone who knows how litmus paper works knows that there's this systematic connection between color and acidity and is able to translate the redness of the representation into a different feature to be imputed to the lemon juice. The, the, the redness of the representation represents the lemon juice as acidic. And then to go back to the map example that I introduced earlier, if you know how the Mercator projection works, you know that it distorts land masses um, as you get up to the poles. So you know that they appear larger on the map than they actually are in reality. And you can correct for this. So one of the ways that you can correct for this is, is, is with this image um, with the, uh, I think it's the Tissot index, um, where you have these red circles on top and those red circles are telling you that areas under those red circles correspond to the same size area in uh, the actual um, Earth's surface. So in this case, you might infer um, by looking on the map that uh, a certain area in Greenland is a very different size from a certain area in Africa. But you could infer that the represented areas are the same um, based on your knowledge about how the Mercator projection distorts that feature of the Earth's map. So in order to accommodate um, these sorts of cases and others, uh, Roman Frigg and I have developed a different account of scientific representation which explicitly doesn't rely on this um, uh, uh, um, exploitation of some proposed similarity relations. The details don't matter too much. What's important is that we argue that models come with what we call keys. So the keys which accompany a model are things that tell the model user how to translate a feature of the model object into a feature to be exported to the target system. And then the point is, is that if you have this key in place, um, then you can allow for instances of accurate representation, which don't turn on similarities between the model and the target, but rather turn on whether or not the target has the features that appear after the result of using the key. So there's some examples we've already seen. In caricature, we know that the, the, sort of the artistic conventions associate certain features, big noses with certain um, personality traits, when using litmus paper, we have a key which uh, associates colors with pH values. And then you could think about a certain, maybe more complicated key, which tells you how to reason uh, with areas of, of, of in the Mercator projection um, into areas of the target system. Okay, now our sort of claim, and it's, it's more programmatic than anything, um, is that we should think about these keys as being associated with the scientific disciplines um, in which the models are used. And we think that in general, these keys are the sort of things that you learn when you learn about the conditions under which you can apply your model um, and the sort of confidence levels that you'll have in the results of your model use. Um, but in general, they might be implicit. And what we're urging, and we have uh, investigated some of them um, separately, um, is that it's a good job for philosophers of science to go about investigating or trying to make explicit the sorts of keys that are implicit in the different modeling frameworks. And the reason that this is important is that if you adopt this way of thinking about representation, um, then it means that uh, it, it sort of allows for this logical gap between idealization qua distortion an idealization qua misrepresentation. So the point is you only know if your model is, a rep, is an accurate or inaccurate representation with respect to the key that's used to accompany it. So we can't just read off the fact that an idealized model um, is a distorted version of the target system, that it thereby misrepresents the target system. We also have to know, well, what sort of features um, do the model users actually end up imputing to the target on the basis of their use of the model. So one reason why this matters then um, is uh, considerations about whether or not we should think about things like explanation and understanding um, as being veridical or factored. So uh, Arnon actually gave a great example of uh, 
a, a great defense of this sort of view um, in the first talk. Um, I guess I'm taking uh, as my default the idea that I, I see the dialectic in the opposite direction, which is we start off by assuming that explanation should be factive. And then many defenders of non-factivity come and say, well, look at these instances of explanation which aren't factive. And then the question is, is are they right to assume um, uh, that these things are non-factive? So Elisa Bocula is a, a prominent defender of the idea that we can have non-factive explanation, non-vertical explanation. <laughs> Um, and the example that she uses for this is the example that I briefly touched on earlier. So there's some phenomena in the world that you're interested in explaining. Um, in this case, it's the fact that uh, high tide and low, like the difference between high tide and low tide varies across the lunar month. Sometimes they're really far apart and sometimes they're a bit close together and this thing goes like this over the course of the month. And she talks about how you would go about explaining that phenomena um, uh, using a Newtonian model. So you would do as follows. You would say, OK, so let's construct the model. We have three bodies, um, the Earth, the Moon, and the Sun, um, with Newtonian force holding between all of them. Uh, we know that, uh, I think you can see my cursor. So because of the Newtonian force between the Moon and the Earth, you get this tidal bulge. This is the, the water on the Earth's surface. And then as the Earth rotates under that over the course of a day, that's what gives you high tide and low tide. But as the moon orbits around the Earth, the direction of that bulge changes depending on where the moon is. And then we also know that there's a, in the model at least, there's a gravitational force between the sun and the Earth, which induces much smaller tidal bulge because of how far away the sun is. And then the explanation for why tidal bulges, um, uh, sorry, why tidal range changes across the course of the lunar month is that in certain cases during the month, they're going to be aligned with one another, the Earth, Moon, and the Sun, all on the same axis. So the tidal bulges associated with the Moon's gravity and with the Sun's gravity reinforce each other. We have a higher high tide and a lower low tide. But in other cases during the lunar month, uh, when the Earth and the Moon are orthogonal to the Earth and the Sun, you don't get that reinforcement effect. So the high tide isn't as high because it's only based on the Earth's gravity rather than, sorry, the moon's gravity uh, rather than the um, sun. Okay, so we had something that we were trying to explain um, why the uh, tide, tidal range was varying over the course of a month. And we constructed a model um, uh, which in an important sense was an idealized version or a distorted version of what's going on in the actual world in order to offer such an explanation. And it's for this, these sorts of reasons that Alyssa uh, argues that we should um, reject the idea that explanation has to be factored. So here we have what looks like a non-factored explanation. We take for granted that it performs the explanatory role that it does. So we have to rethink how we should think about explanation. Now, it's important to, re so just as this Arnon also went over this too, um, when we talk about the sorts of explanations that are given um, in these sorts of cases, uh, the thing that we're relying on is how we can answer these W questions, these what if things have been different questions. And in particular, uh, the explanations um, that in question are supposed to tell us things of the form, how would the explanandum behave were the explanands to change? So that's the sort of basic idea. And then the thing that I think bears pointing out is that if you're in the context of model-based science, where it's unclear whether or not the thing doing the explaining is the model or the target system, um, then you should one, carefully distinguish between talk of the model and talk of the target. Um, and two, you should also be quite careful as to exactly what you think the explanation in question is. This is relevant when it, when it comes to determining whether or not the explanation is factor. So with the example of the Newtonian tides, um, I think that there's sort of two explanations which are quite close to each other, um, but it, that it's important to distinguish. So the first is, well, suppose all you were trying to explain was tidal range. Well, then in which case, according to the counterfactual account of explanation, 
you have to uh, explain how it would change were the thing doing the explaining change in this place, in this case, the different celestial positions. There is another explanation though, that you might think that the model gives, which isn't tidal range itself, but it's why tidal range depends on um, the celestial positions. And in this case, if you think that the model can provide this, this sort of explanation, um, this is where Newtonian gravity, the idealized aspect of the model, would seem to be playing the representational role or the explanatory role that it does. So just to put this out in terms of some pictures, um, if all you thought the model was able to explain was the fact that, sorry, if all you thought the model was going to explain was tidal range, and it was to do so by telling you how tidal range would vary depending on how celestial positions would vary, then in terms of whether or not the model is accurate, it's accurate with respect to all of those features. So there's no inaccuracy associated with that first order explanation. So if Alyssa thinks that um, uh, uh, this example is gonna put pressure on the verticality of explanation, then she's, I think she's gonna be led to conclude that there's a, there's a richer explanatory question that the model can answer, namely the second order explanation. And she, she does, so I've spoken to her about it. So then the question is, is, well, if you think the model is providing this second order explanation, then what are the what if things have been different questions is the model able to answer? So it might look like the model answers the question of what if Newtonian gravity had been different? But the problem with phrasing it in that way is you're mixing up talk between model, model feature, Newtonian gravity, and target feature, uh, tidal range in the world. So I don't think that you should think about those counterfactuals in, sense, in the sense of what if Newtonian gravity had been different, but rather you should think about the counterfactual as what if the thing represented by Newtonian gravity um, in the world, what if that had been different? And that way you get the counterfactual, you have a counterfactual at the level of the model, a counterfactual at the level of the target, but you don't have this cross model target counterfactuals. So in this case, you have celestial position, uh, sorry, tidal range depends on celestial position in the model and also in the target. But you have another thing that you're trying to explain, which is why tidal range depends on celestial position. And what we're looking for is the um, explanations in the target that's represented by Newtonian gravity. So then the question is, is if you're thinking about the model in these terms, how should you think about the representational role of Newtonian gravity in that example? And here I want to go back to the uh, account of representation that I introduced earlier, where we should think about, well, what are the keys that people who use this model, um, what keys do they associate with it in this sort of explanatory use? <coughs> and the point I want to make is that we know that Newtonian gravity isn't part of the ontological furniture of the world. We also know that what we think is the ontological furniture, at least to more accurate approximation, um, space-time curvature, we know that that approximates Newtonian gravity in the appropriate regimes. So in which case, when it comes to interpreting that explanatory use of the model, we can interpret Newtonian gravity in the model, not as misrepresenting some aspect of the world, but as accurately representing uh, space-time curvature and the fact that it approximates Newtonian gravity in the appropriate regime. And then the point is, is that if we adopt that sort of key um, uh, associated with that sort of explanation, um, then the explanation that's come out of it has ended up being um, a perfectly vertical one. There's no misrepresentation that's gone on. There is distortion in the sense that there's a feature of the model which plays a representationally relevant role, um, but it needn't be understood as, uh, as um, misrepresentation. Okay, so that's one reason why it matters. Um, another reason, uh, I take it, um, uh, Arnon was giving a defense of this earlier on as well, when he was talking about activity of understanding, um, and it's also introduced by Angela and K. Elgin too, um, which is uh, 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 the idea that by realizing that idealizations are so prevalent in science, we should rethink whether or not the aims of science are factored. And I, I think that the, the, the point, or the rather minimal point that I'm making here is that that rests on a sort of hidden premise, 
where you, ass you assume that the idealizations in question are misrepresentations. And what I've argued previously is, the, is that there isn't, um, is there, a, there is a, at the very least another way of thinking about this. Um, so one way that, uh, uh, again, Roman and I um, have posed this uh, is, is by taking um, Kay Elgin to be offering a sort of um, a challenge in the sense that she identifies three individually attractive but mutually inconsistent propositions. So one of them is veritism, um, the idea that accurate representation in the relevant respects is necessary for epistemic acceptability. The other is literalism, which is that idealized models should be interpreted by a similarity accounts of representation, i.e. dissimilarities are understood as misrepresentations. And then the third is that our best contemporary science includes idealized models, things which are not similar to their targets in the relevant respects, but are still epistemically acceptable. So if you think about Kate's project in True Enough in these terms, um, and I think you could also extend the same to, to, to Angela's project too, um, the option that, that, that they take is to reject veritism, um, to allow for the fact that we have epistemic acceptability or aims of science, which don't turn on accurate representation. And then what me and Roman point out in, in, in the paper associated with these claims uh, is that there is another option available. Um, you can hold on to veritism and instead you can reject literalism and thereby try and explore the different keys that could be associated with the different uses um, um, of models in science, uh, but in a way that allows those models to remain accurate representations, despite the fact that they contain distorted uh, aspects of their target, of distorted versions of their target. Um, okay. Uh, this doesn't matter, so I'll ignore that. Um, <clears throat> So I'll just conclude, just in the interest of time. Um, the sort of minimal point that I want to make is that questions that turn on the sort of epistemic successes associated with model-based science should be quite sensitive to the, to the structure in which you think about these, uh, uh, this representational process in the first place. So one of these is uh, being explicit as to whether or not you think that modeling has this indirect structure that I was talking about or whether or not you think that representation, you think that the model descriptions are just um, direct descriptions of the target system in question. Um, and then the point is, is that lots of the, or not lots, but many of the arguments uh, which are sort of driving towards non-factive, non-veridical ways of thinking about the aims of science uh, seem to rely on particular ways of understanding the structure of the model-based reasoning in the first place. And then the point that, or the sort of other option that uh, uh, I've tried to outline is that there are at least some ways of thinking um, about the, 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 the way that models represent, whereby things like um, idealization don't turn out to be, by definition, misrepresentations. And it sort of opens up the space to try and explore other aspects of the use of models. So rather than investigating the features of models themselves, investigating um, the, 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 the keys that we think implicitly accompany them in certain modeling frameworks. And that's it. Thanks.